I hated my family, I hated my country, I hated my life. I was just running away. I got involved with some really bad people in Israel and I became very wealthy for a small period of time in my life and my life was just drugs, parties. I used to be kind of like a hippie. I was absolutely fearless. I remember I would wake up in the morning and I'd go and buy a pack of cigarettes and I'd put a line of cocaine in each and every single one of them and I wouldn't leave the house. Before I had a whole box of Marlboro cigarettes with a line of coke in each and every one of them. My life became a living hell. Um, yeah, I was just a mess. I was doing so much drugs like cocaine and weed, LSD, ecstasy, you name it. I party every night. And one night I decided I'm going to jump. I came back from a party in Tel Aviv. It was probably like six o'clock in the morning, it was an after party, I was living on the second floor. And I was hanging off the balcony and I was looking downstairs and I said, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna jump. And I was really deciding, okay, this is it, <laughs> I'm gonna jump. Hi, welcome to Touching the Afterlife. This is Julie, and I'm so excited to bring with us today Talitha. Talitha has such an incredible testimony. You're going to need to grab your coffee, grab your tea, whatever you love to drink, even if you're listening to this and you're doing something. Just don't miss a, any part of this because it is so engaging. So welcome with me today, Talitha. Thank you very much for having, having me on. It's a pleasure to meet you. Well, Talitha, would you begin with your testimony where you want to begin? Yes, I think um, the best way would be to start all the way from the beginning. Um, so I'll just start a little bit with my childhood. Um, I was born in the Netherlands and, and since I was a young child, my parents would always take me on holidays to Israel. And I remember the first time I would go to Israel, I would immediately feel home. I would always have a special connection with that country. So when I was 17, a week before my 18th birthday, I decided to quit everything. I had a boyfriend, broke up, I was in college, I stopped everything and I bought a, a ticket with the help of my grandfather. And I told my parents a week prior to that, I'm moving to Israel. I'm going to volunteer in a kibbutz and I'm never going to come back because I hated my family. I hated my country. I hated my life. I was just running away. And obviously there was a little bit of tension in the family. My mom wasn't happy with the idea. Obviously my dad was very positive about it. He was careless. So in the end of the day, I did. So I moved to Israel and I moved to a, a kibbutz in the north, Kibbutz Yiftach, right on the border of Lebanon. And I volunteered there. And after the kibbutz, I also volunteered in the Israeli army. They had an organization called uh, Sarel that would put people from all over the world to volunteer on the army basis. You weren't al allowed to leave because otherwise you'd be a, a target. But I was allowed to be on the base and make food packaging and you know all that stuff. So after I volunteered in the army, I got involved with some really bad people in Israel. And I, I don't want to speak about what it is that I did, but I got involved in some really bad activities and I became very wealthy for a small period of time in my life. And I also became addicted to a lot of drugs. Um, so yeah, my lifestyle was very, very crazy. I ended up living in Israel for six years and my life was just drugs, parties. I used to be kind of like a hippie, going to nature parties in the deserts. I drink. I was absolutely fearless. Because of my childhood, I, I never really felt loved and I didn't know how to give love, receive love, but I also had no boundaries. boundaries. I was absolutely careless and fearless. So it was literally party <laughs> until you drop dead. And it got really, really bad. It got to a point where I remember I would wake up in the morning and I'd go and buy a pack of cigarettes and I'd put a line of cocaine in each and every single one of them and I wouldn't leave the house. 
before I had a whole box of Marlboro cigarettes with a line of Coke in each and every one of them. This is, I got to that stage. Um, yeah, I had a relationship in Israel as well for a year and a half with a man. And we broke up. He was a lovely man, but we broke up because I simply didn't feel worthy. I felt like he was too good for me. I wasn't worthy enough. And I left him. We separated. And after we separated, I fell into a very deep depression. And it got to a point where I was so drugged up and I was so abused. I was also sexually assaulted in the first week on my arrival, which is something I've never mentioned to anyone, not even my mom knows this. Um, yeah, on the first week when I moved to Israel, I was I was raped. Um, sorry, I've never talked about this in public. Um, but yeah, my life became a living hell. Um, yeah, I was just a mess. Uh, I started having panic attacks as well because of all the drugs. I was doing so much drugs like cocaine and weed, LSD, ecstasy, you name it. I'd party every night. I'd wake up in, in, in places not remembering who I am, what my name was. I had to take sleeping pills as well to balance the drugs out, to just go to sleep. Um, and one night I decided I'm going to jump. I came back from a party in Tel Aviv. It was probably like six o'clock in the morning, it was an after party. And I hanged off my balcony. I was living on the second floor. Um, and I just, I had enough. I was very intoxicated. So yeah, I was very drunk and drugs and everything. And I threw my phone on the floor <laughs> and I was hanging off the balcony and I was looking downstairs and I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to jump. And I was really deciding, okay, this is it. <laughs> and God already worked in my life back then because a miracle happened. All of a sudden, my ex that I just broken up with, that I hadn't spoken with for, for months, he ringed me. And he said to me, whatever it is that you're about to do, don't do it. I had a feeling that I needed to call you because I felt something is wrong. Don't do it. And I just broke down in tears. I, I was such a mess. He came, I told him that I was going to jump. He came to the flat. And yeah, he basically took care of me for a few months. I went to live with him. We didn't sleep together. We didn't have a relationship. He was just looking after me like a baby because I was so broken and so lost and so addicted. And he convinced me after six years of having this very reckless lifestyle to go back to the Netherlands. And I really didn't want to go because I'd go right back into hell. <laughs> But I had no other choice because also I didn't have a visa anymore. I was always able to get a visa, whether through someone or through a relationship. But yeah, so went back to the Netherlands. Um, wasn't a good good idea. My, me and my mom, we didn't get along at all, especially after living for six years on my own in a country far away, living this life. All of a sudden, I was in this small country town in the Netherlands in my mom's house. <laughs> So after about a week, someone from Israel told me that, he, that she has a friend living in London who offered me a job and I could go and, and live with him and, and work in London. He had a restaurant here. So I said, why not? I've got nothing to lose. I barely unpacked my suitcase. Um, and I said to my mom, OK, I'm moving to London. I have a strange man in London who bought me a ticket and I can work for him. He can take me in his house until I sort myself out, whatever. So gone I was, I was in London, um, started working in this restaurant, living with this man, and we kind of had a thing going on between us, it wasn't a serious relationship, but he was abusive towards me, and the neighbor that was living downstairs noticed that, that he was not treating me very well, but obviously I was dependent on him because he was my boss, he was also my housemate, because all of a sudden we'd live together, and he said to me, why don't you come and move in with me? And I said, OK, so I packed all my stuff and I moved from the third floor <laughs> to the second floor in with the neighbor. And the neighbor was really nice. And he well, he was he, he was a drug dealer and a user. And I loved drugs and I thought, great, now I don't have to pay for it. So, again, 
Same thing in London. We started going to nature parties. I started doing drugs and we were kind of like on and off. I might have gone back to the Netherlands a couple of times for a few weeks and come back. But eventually um, I became pregnant and it was not something by choice. But as I said, I was reckless. I didn't really, I wasn't careful with these kind of things. So I got pregnant and I got pregnant in the moment where I decided to just end it with him. So, but I had to tell him and I said, listen, I'm pregnant. I'm going to have an abortion. I tried to book an appointment after thinking about it for a while. I did. But just before I went to the appointment of the abortion clinic, I said, let's go to the doctor and see how far I am. And I discovered that I was almost two months pregnant. And it was terrible because I was still doing cocaine and drugs and drinking and everything. And, you know, after six weeks, there's a heartbeat with the baby. And when they put the, the scan, when they put the thingy on my, on my belly and I could hear the heartbeat, I just, something inside of me, and uh, this must have been, again, God intervening because I never wanted to have children. I never wanted to live together, get married, nothing. Family, marriage, no. That was like a big no-no for me. But something inside of me told me, this is not your call. I'm not the author of life and death. I knew deep inside that this was wrong, even though I didn't want to stay together with my then boyfriend, dealer, user, whatever. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So I had the baby. And that was very difficult because after I gave birth, I suffered from a postnatal depression. And that was, yeah, that was not fun. I don't know if people are familiar with what that is, but it's like being afraid with your own child, being in the same room, because I was afraid I was going to harm her. And I had all these thoughts and images in my head of smashing her head against the wall that would just come intrusive. And I didn't understand it. I didn't understand at the time that I had a postnatal depression. And I was also afraid to talk to people about it because I was afraid that if I would tell someone or social service that I'd come and take my baby away. At the same time, I I didn't have a good treatment when I was a child. I didn't know how to give, receive, loved. All I knew was sex, drugs, rock and roll. Um, I didn't feel love towards my child. I've never been abusive towards her, but I was a very selfish, careless, broken mother. And I said, okay, now I have my baby. Um, we don't have family here in England. His family lives in Israel. My family lives in the Netherlands. Um, let's. I, I I thought, great, now we can move back to Israel. You're going to take me back to Israel where even though that I had a hellish lifestyle there, I had a lot of friends in Israel. So we got married on the paper for the sake of me getting a visa and he became my husband. Uh, I bought a dress on eBay for like 40 quid. I had only two witnesses. It was a very small wedding. Moved to Israel and things got even worse. It, it's my husband became abusive towards me. It became physical at some point that his brother had to separate between us and things escalated. He took the passport of my daughter and he said to me, you know what, you can F off, but uh, my daughter is staying here. And in Israel, there's this law. If you are married, you need to ask your husband permission to have to leave the country with the child. Like I could leave, but because it's his baby as well, you know, I need to ask this. Is, this is this law there. And it was an absolute hell because I felt trapped. His family would stick on his side, even after I told them what had happened. Um, it was I was so lonely and I had this postnatal depression. And um, I went to the Dutch embassy in Israel and I told them my story. And they said, well, guess what? You're not the first one. There's many like you. Best thing you can do, play the game along. Be super nice to your husband. Treat him well. Sleep with him. Cook clean. Don't argue until everything is good. And, and convince him to go to Europe with you, whether on a holiday, because once you cross the border, he can't do anything anymore. And that's what I did. And it was an absolute living hell for six months. Uh, I played along the game. I slept with my husband while absolutely being disgusted by his presence. I had so much hatred. I remember that I even wished death upon him just so I could get out of this situation. But I played the game along and eventually convinced him to come with me to the Netherlands, um, which was a very silly idea, but out of desperation for my daughter. And I remember that <laughs> once we flew to the Netherlands, my mom said, I'm going to invite all of you tickets, you know, for Christmas. And um, she did. 
because my mom was aware of this situation and she knew that I was coming with my husband and my daughter. So once we arrived to the Netherlands, I waited until we got to my home. And um, after playing the good wife for six months, I took him to the garden to smoke cigarettes. And then the full load came out and I told him the, the most horrific things. And I told him, that's it. I'm staying here now. You, I don't care what you do. I hate you. I don't love you. Um, don't touch me. That's it. I'm never, ever going back to Israel. And my daughter's staying with me. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> in the Netherlands itself, things escalated between me and my mother. Things were really bad. Uh, also, my husband didn't get along with my mother. And at some point, things got so bad that my husband said, you know what? I'm going to move back to London. I'm going to get a flat there. And I'm going to get a job because he used to do gardening as well. He kind of like was, he used to do gardening, but he also used to do his other dodgy business on the sides. And he said, I'm going to set my life up there. And if you want, you can come with your daughter and move in with me. And he went. And after a couple of months, me, my mom, we clinched. And I said, you know what? I still hate my country. I don't want to be here. I'm here all alone. I won't go to London. So I did eventually so I moved in with my husband again we were together for another year and a half I guess and I got to a point where I was so broken from the from the insides you know like a lot of abuse and and pain and things got so out of control and I was feeling so miserable that I was thinking to take my own life and I felt completely unworthy unloved and I thought, you know what, this world is 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 better off without me. Even my daughter, she'd be better off without me because I'm I'm a failure, <laughs> you know. And I started having images in my head of 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 how I was gonna do it, options. I could see myself sitting on the doorstep to the garden where I would like take a knife and start cutting like crazy stuff. And it, it became a reality in my head. And I said, you know what? Before I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna have a chat with God. Because I was never interested in God, religion. I never believed the Bible. I thought there was something, but I didn't know what, but never crossed my mind. Although in those final years of my marriage, I did realize a lot of evil happening in the world. And this is something that always made me question, where does all this evil come from? Why is the world the way that it is? Why does evil happen to good people? I don't understand it. There must be a reason for it. And I figured out if there is evil, then there must be good. So I said, let's let's see <laughs> if there is a God. So one night I put my daughter to sleep. And after I put her to sleep uh, in the bedroom, I went to the living room and my husband was out and about. And I just said, you know, God, if you exist, then you need to show it to me. Because if you're not going to show it to me, I'm going to take my life. And I was dead serious. That was the second time. And the second time God intervened because I kneeled down and I saw a light, a bright light. It became super bright around me. And I felt a hand touching my shoulder and I heard a voice, but it wasn't an audible voice. It, it was an inner voice. And something said, I am here. And then I just started bawling. I just started crying. I started shaking. I don't remember how long that took, but it took a while. And then I just, when it stopped, when I stopped crying and I got up from the floor, I was in complete shock because clearly there was a God and it was trying to communicate with me. But, but which God? I was just completely shocked by the whole experience. So I went to bed. And the next morning when I woke up, I was looking for a playgroup for my daughter. And this was on a weekday, it wasn't on a Sunday. And I was just Googling on my phone playgroups for, for kids nearby. And it gave me an address. So I took the bus, went there, and it landed me in front of a church. And it was close. It was a huge church. And I was like, you must be kidding me. And I thought this might maybe just a sign from God. And it was, <laughs> but it was closed. So I called the number on Google and I said, I think I'm in the wrong place because I'm standing in front of a church. And they were like, yeah, yeah, this is the right place. Just walk around on, on, in the back. There's a little room on the side of the church. And that's where we have the play group. It's part of the church organization. And I said, okay. So I went there and when I got in, 
I started talking to these people and they were super nice. I didn't dare telling anyone about my experience because I thought they must be thinking that I'm crazy. Now I understand these are the only people that probably say, think this is not weird at all because we believe in God. <laughs> but I didn't say anything. I just zipped my mouth. And um, the pastor was there that day with his kids as well. And he said, why don't you come to church on Sunday? And I didn't have anything to lose. And also they told me on Sunday they have like the Sunday school for little kids. So you can drop your daughter and maybe she'll like it. So I said, okay, why not? So when I came home, I told my my husband, <laughs> and he's Jewish Israeli, I'm going to church on Sunday. And he was looking at me like if I have lost my mind. But he would he didn't care. He was like, do whatever you want, you know. And I did. I went to the church and um I was wearing ripped dream ripped jeans, shaven head, lots of jewelry, crop top. I looked like a junkie, like honestly, like I just walked out of a punk bar. Went like that to the church, dropped off my daughter in Sunday school, sat down, and the whole lecture was about why Jesus Christ died for our sin. And as I was sitting there, I was listening to that, and I thought, these people are absolutely insane. They're cr <laughs> they're crazy. <laughs> Like, honestly, why does God, if one of the commandments is you shall not murder, why does God murder his own son? Why does blood need to be shed for my sin? I'm a sinner. I'm a bad person after everything that happened to me. I'm, I'm, I'm just being like abused and, 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 and hurt all the time. And I, I'm a sinner. So I thought, no, 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 this is not right. So I went after the service up to the pastor and I, I, I asked him, like, honestly, what is this? Is this some kind of blood ritual? Like, what's wrong with you people? And he said, he, he gave me a really bad answer. And yeah, so I still felt nothing. And I kept on going just for the sake of my daughter to go to this Sunday school. And after a couple of weeks, I stopped going. They did give me a Bible. So I had a Bible and I was starting to read it just a little bit here and there. I always found prophecies very uh, interesting because of, of what things that were happening in the world. But I didn't really take it seriously. And also because I was married to a Jewish man, he had a lot of friends and some of them were religious and they introduced me to rabbis and they are incredibly smart. They have answers for everything. So I started listening to rabbis and I slowly started converting to Judaism. So here I am, married to a secular Israeli Jew, and now I'm living like an Orthodox Jew. Very, <laughs> my, my husband really thought that I'd lost, I completely lost it because I started covering myself. I started keeping the Shabbat. I started listening to all these Torah classes online. And um, yeah, he eventually said to me, listen, I'm concerned for your mental health. I think you're going mental and I'm seriously worried about you. And I was just digging for the truth, man. And eventually I ended up, because when I was doing all the Shabbat and this and rabbis, I still felt empty. I knew mm -hmm. that God existed, but I didn't know which God. And then eventually I discovered the Jewish roots movement. And I saw, great, this is a mix of both of them, you know. So I got into that, um, ended up going to a messianic congression. So it's like a church on the Saturday where they keep, the, they do believe in Yeshua, the Messiah but they keep all the Jewish holidays and whatever. So I started doing that. And at the same time, my, my, my marriage just deteriorated so badly. It became so toxic that I decided to leave. And I did. I moved in in a very small uh, studio flat on my own. And I thought, great. Now I have all the time in the world to do my homework. I started studying the Bible and I started reading and listening to conspiracies and whatever. And at the same time, when I started looking for this on this journey, because at the time I was I was so confused, like who is speaking the truth and who is not. And for me, Jesus was the biggest no, no. Like I accepted the Old Testament at some point and I knew that there was truth, maybe a little bit to the new. But Jesus is God. No, no, this is not possible. This is not possible. Um at the same time, I was meeting a friend from work. I used to work as a waitress part time in a restaurant and um, Charlotte. And she invited me to go to this place called Metalworks. She introduced me. So after we finished working, she said, I, I, I discovered this place called Metalworks. And this is a, a rock community of metalheads, long hair, 
bearded man with lots of tattoos playing all kind of metal and hard rock, ACDC and all that stuff. And I started going there very often and they would play every Sunday night. And that kind of like became my new church, you know, the Sunday night. So I'd go to Metalworks and I started seeing a guy. He was a beautiful guy, um, Italian dude with long hair, looks like a rock star, very, very talented singer. Um, and yeah, we were kind of like dating on and off. And this man, there, he had a very, very dark presence over him. He was obsessed with Lucifer. He was wearing a pentagram always around his neck and on his belt. And he wanted to have Lucifer tattooed on his back. And he even told me once, I want to take you to Scotland to show you the statue of uh, Lucifer. And once, I will never forget that moment, he just like, like shoved his face in my face and he said, I want your mind, your body and your soul. But like in such a creepy way that I will never, ever forget it. He wasn't a Satanist or at least not claimed to be a Satanist. He was a rock singer. But he was, he had, and he was super nice. Don't get me wrong, because, you know, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. I do understand that now after many hard lessons. Mm -hmm. And he was always very nice to me, very respectful. And yeah, we had a lot of fun. But something inside of me told me something is not right here. And, and what I actually forgot to mention is that when I started digging in the Bible in the last year of my marriage, before I moved on my own, I started suffering for my first sleeping paralysis and I remember that I went to sleep one day on the sofa to have a nap and this is the first time this happened to me and I had no idea what it was and I opened my eyes and I, I realized the presence of something dark was pinning me down on the sofa and it was so strange because at the time I was digging in the bible Jewish roots movement and whatever and I couldn't move but I was fully conscious and in my head because I couldn't scream, I started screaming out the name of Jesus. It just wow. happened. Jesus! Jesus! And boom, it let me go. And I thought that was very, very strange. And these, these attacks, every time I would, I would really dig deep for the truth, and I'd pray a lot, and I'd read the Bible, I mentioned these things started happening to me. I also had, even when I was still married with my ex-husband, that I stepped into the shower and uh, the face of a demon, like literally, like let's say this is the shower, it just came out of the wall like in my face. And I thought, what in the world is this? And much more crazy stuff that wind started blowing in the living room, even though the windows and everything was shut. And that only happened after I went to that church that somebody gave me a Bible, I started reading it, and then Jewish roots, all that stuff. And when I started dating this guy for Metalworks, I was in a spiritual warfare, but I didn't understand it at the time because I had zero knowledge about what spiritual warfare was. I didn't know anything. I knew, yeah, Jesus loves you and, you know, we're sinners. and But I knew nothing, nothing. So these attacks became more prominent because I, I found it strange that all of a sudden I was dating a guy who was obsessed with Lucifer, but he was very charming. He was very nice. He was very popular and talented and all that stuff. But there was just that dark thing. And one day I had an outer body experience where I went to sleep and actually this guy was sleeping next to me. And in the middle of the night, I woke up with my eyes open and I realized I'm awake. Then I left my body, my, my soul or my spirit. I went to the corner of my room of the studio flat that I was living in at the time. And I was looking at myself sleeping. And while I was looking at myself sleeping next to my boyfriend on the bed, I saw the face of a demon. It was about, I don't know, I don't know if you can see it, this big. And it had, it was just the head, had kind of like an oval black shape. And it was very angry. And it was right in front of my face on the bed. And it was harassing me. It was blowing anger in my face. It was going like, like that. And at the same time, I heard a voice coming from the other side saying, you're on the right track. You need to keep on going. You need to keep on going. You're on the right track. It was like I was seeing light and dark. And this was so, so crazy. All that stuff started happening to me. And, you know, 
I I went to that Messianic Congression at the time. So I was going to this metalworks place in the evening. And in, in Saturday, I was going to the Saturday church. And I told people in the Saturday church that I was seeing this guy. And it was something very demonic over him. Whether he was aware of that or not, I don't think so. And this guy told me in, from the church, we should all pray for him. So they started praying for, for him and for me. And they said, you know, anyway, you're not married. You're not meant to be in this relationship. And um, yeah. Crying, praying, um, went back home, took the tube, got back home. And then this guy calls me up and he's like, where have you been? And he knew I was going to the Saturday church. And I told him I've been to the church. And he said he wouldn't believe me. All of a sudden he said, no, you're cheating on me. And I said, no, I just came back from the church. And he's like, no, you're cheating on me. You're cheating on me. You're cheating on me. He went absolutely nuts. And we didn't argue. We didn't fight. This came out of nowhere. And then he just hang up the phone. And after that, I get two messages on the WhatsApp, voice messages. And it's like his voice changed. I got one message and I will rephrase what I can. It said, this is a message for the person who lives inside my Talita. Get out of that soul. You're in the wrong body and give my Talita back. I know you can hear me. Get out of that soul. And then he said a swear word. And after that, I got another message that literally he said to me, amen, Satan. And I said, OK, this, this oh. is not OK. So obviously we broke up. Um, and after all these experiences, I got so angry with God because do you know, I was trying to look for the truth and then it started storming in my life and I didn't feel like I deserved this. Uh, I, I, I just and also we prayed and then the next day I broke up with this guy. So I thought God had taken him away from me and he did. And praise the Lord. Thank you <laughs> for doing that because he protected me. But I didn't say it that way because I had no idea about the Bible, spiritual warfare, whatever. And you know what? Instead of continuing uh, looking for God. I took all my Bibles and I had a lot of Bibles in different translations because I was in all kind of conspiracies as well. And I speak four languages. So I had a Bible in German, in Dutch, in Hebrew, in English, different. I had, I had a whole collection by that time. And I took all of it, put it in a bag and I gave it to the charity shop next to my home. And I said, enough, enough. I'm not doing this anymore. I cursed God out loud in my studio. And I said, I hate you. Go away from me. I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. And after that experience, I got into the new age spirituality, but like full on. And I convinced myself that you create your own reality. And that's such a deep and clever deception of the enemy <laughs> that, you know, there is no ultimate truth, you know, and that way no one is right and no one is wrong because you create your own reality with your thoughts. And I thought maybe I needed a reason to believe because I was so depressed. I was so miserable. And I'd convinced myself that I manifested all these things because I wanted it to be true. So I really thought that these things that God showed me, all this stuff that happened to me that, that didn't happen. I just completely, I chose to, to be willfully blind at that point. And this is a very dangerous thing to do. <laughs> I understand now. So I rebelled against God and um, I started listening to Louise Hay, Wayne Dyer, all these self-help gurus. I wrote on my mirror, I am enough with red lipstick. I was doing self-manifestation, got into the Silva mind control method as well. I started doing Wim Hof breathing. I started exercising, cold showers, doing Qigong. I was doing so much stuff. And you know what? It worked. It really worked because I got incredibly fit. I started uh, teaching Pilates. Eventually, I became a personal trainer. I was teaching HIIT and Pilates. I became super healthy. I became super fit. Um, stopped going, obviously, to that uh, Messianic church on the Saturday Completely ignored that. I said, I will never talk about that again. I will never go down that path again. Because when I go to God, he just crushed. my life gets just crushed. And guess what? After a while, the man of my dreams walked into my life. Now, I am willing to say now, this is the refined version of boyfriend number one, which I now understand because God made it very clear. The enemy knows my weaknesses, and I have a weakness for rock stars, dating tall men, beautiful Latino men with long hair that are talented and charming, you know. So, yeah, number two walks into my life. 
Um, and I fell madly in love with this man because he was gorgeous and talented and super kind, super calm. It was almost too good to be true. And now I understand it was because I, I remember even saying to my one of my good friends, man, this is too good to be true. It, it, I had a relationship like like fairy tales in the movies. We never fight. We never argue. He was this this popular, beautiful Latino musician. I was the popular fitness girl. We were the perfect couple. A lot of people used to envy us and say, wow, we got it all together, you know, and whatever. And uh, yeah, my life for the first time, for the first time after everything I went through went well. And I said, wow, this is it, you know. <laughs> oh boy, did I know. And then the pandemic happened. And when the pandemic happened, Something inside of me started pulling, and I could see the evil that is happening around us in the world. And I had a little bit of knowledge about biblical prophecy, the new world order, and I dived down the rabbit hole again. And when I heard the words build back better and the great reset, alarm bells started ringing in my head because I knew about the, the beast system, the antichrist system. And also prior to that, I was a little bit into conspiracies because I used to be part of this metalworks community, this rock and roll community, and I could notice a lot of satanic symbolism. I could notice that people in the music industry, because I was always dating musicians, are obsessed with the occult, like the Bapomath and all the songs are always about empathy for the devil. I'm on the highway to hell. No, nothing about God, righteous, holy. And I picked up on that already. So I started going down the conspiracy rabbit hole big time during the pandemic. And then God was drawing me. Something inside of me told me I need to go come back to God. And um, I really didn't want to. I was afraid to touch that part of my past. Um, but I couldn't ignore this feeling. And I said, oh, no. What if everything that happened to me, all these these things that God showed me, what if they really happened and I didn't imagine that? What, what if all these demons, all these sleeping paralysis and all this crazy stuff? Well, what if, what if this actually, what if it's true? So I said, you know what? I need to go on my knees and repent. And I felt very embarrassed. So again, I went on my knees in the living room and uh, I felt so ashamed. I knew I messed up because deep inside I knew it, but I was just ignoring it because I had built this perfect fake, fake life. and. I just said to God, like, God, I'm so sorry. If you are real, then you need to make it crystal clear to me because I cannot go through all that stuff again. I need you to help me and to show me the truth. And I'm sorry that I I walked, <laughs> walked away from you, basically. <laughs> and I also told God, maybe, maybe you aren't real, but I, I'm not sure. I'm very confused at this point. Maybe I'm going insane again. So I just told God the truth, how I felt. Lo and behold, what happened the next day? Guess what? I went to my boyfriend, the beautiful musician boyfriend. We had a barbecue and I started talking to him. I was slightly drunk, not very drunk. I was tipsy. And I was talking to him about the circumstances in the pandemic and that I could see and feel that something is off and it's not right. And he got really, really angry with me. And I was interrupting him multiple times speaking and he couldn't stand it. And the things just blew up. He just, he, he threw me out at like one o'clock in the morning out of his house. It's like a demon came out of him. And imagine we had a fairy tale relationship. Everything was perfectly well. We never fight, we never argue, everything. He, he was, he's the most calmest Zen guy you can imagine never raises his voice, never gets upset, Mr. Perfect, right? And that night, it's like God showed me a different side because he got so angry at me for telling him that I think something is not right with the world because I told him the world is not what we think it is. I, I truly believe there's something wrong. I started, God started slightly opening my eyes and he got very angry. He just dragged me down the hallway by my arm, pushed me out of the door, and that was it. It was really, really bad. So we broke up, and I said to myself, okay, let's get this straight. Everything goes super well in my life. I have uh, my fitness business that I was setting up. It, wasn't, it was in the beginning, so it wasn't super popular. 
okay, you know, I'm got super fit. I have this this lovely boyfriend and I'm popular and I go to all these gigs and honestly, and now I pray. And the day after I break up with my boyfriend and I thought to myself, maybe this is a sign <laughs> from God. But this time I didn't get angry with God. This time I said, I need to be careful with my moves here. And I think deep inside, I knew that the Bible was true. I just was rebelling against it. Oh boy, I am so stubborn. So we separated for about three weeks. And in those three weeks, I decided to take the time to go back to God. So I bought my Bible again from WH Smith online. I remember I was very scared to buy that Bible because I knew if I'm going to buy it, probably things are going to happen. And guess what? <laughs> they did. So I bought the Bible and I started reading the Bible again and praying. And something other strange happened to me. I went to meet a friend for a drink in a bar because that was during the pandemic where we could go out, but we had to sign in and you had to book it and whatever. But things started opening up. So we went to a bar. I had one beer. And then all of a sudden, I didn't feel like staying. I wanted to go back home. So I just told her, listen, I, I, I need to go back home. I wanted to go back home. Okay, fine. Went back home. I was sober, wasn't tipsy, drunk, nothing. And I had a journal and I would write a lot of things. And because so many things had happened in my life, I said, I'm just going to have to write it down. I was going to write down my thoughts about everything that happened because I, I like to write because it's like a therapy. If I write stuff on the paper, then I can just let go of it. So I took my pen and my journal and I started writing, but I realized that I wasn't writing. And I know it sounds absolutely mad, but I was holding the pen and I was writing it, but it wasn't me writing. Something else was writing through me. Some people call this automatic writing. It, and I believe God put a thought in my head and I wrote that down. That God, God just spoke to me in that moment and I wrote down whatever I got this inner voice said. This is the only thing I can. Say, but God can make the impossible possible. We can't put him in a box. He can do whatever he wants. So after I wrote a few sentences down on this uh, on, in my journal, I looked at it and I said, what did I just write? And it said, literally, you are a child of God and you need to come back to me. No matter what you've done in the past, I love you. And I said to myself, what in the world is happening? To me, I literally in that moment, I thought I was dreaming. I even pinched myself and I could feel it, but I thought I was dreaming. I, I literally, I thought this is not possible. So I decided to put this journal on the table. And if it was there in the next, the next day when I'd wake up, I knew it wasn't a dream. So that's what I did. I put the journal, went to sleep, woke up in the morning, went back to the living room and it was still there. Mm -hmm. So then I knew, okay, this, this is, this is not a joke. This I asked God for a sign. There was my sign. He couldn't be more clear with me. So after, after three weeks, that happened in that three weeks that we were broken up, that I took the time to reconcile with God, apologize. And I called my, my ex-boyfriend because he kind of regret what he did. He felt out of control because of what happened. And he was trying to get in contact with me. He wrote me a couple of, couple of letters to my work. And I said, okay, let's call him. So I called him. And this is the first time. And we'd already been together there for, at the time for like a year and a half. I never, ever released anything about my past that had to do with God. Never, never. But I decided to go and speak to him about God, that I used to be religious. I used to live like a Jew. And then I start telling him about, you know, the outer body experience and also about my ex and all these things happening to me. And, you know, I, I started talking to him about it and he seemed very acceptant of it. And he even said to me once, like, baby, if you become a Muslim tomorrow, I will love you and support you no matter what you do. And I said, great, great. So we decided to get back together, but uh, I did tell him that from now on, God is in charge of me. I'm no longer in control. God is in control. And I wasn't even bored again at the time. I'd said so much stuff to him that after I said it, I said, what did I just say? Very strange. So <laughs> anyhow, we got back together. Everything is all right. 
And then I started praying to God and I said, like, God, I need you to send me people because definitely not my friends from this rock and roll metal community. And, and that was my life. I've been part of that community for about 10 years. All my good friends were from this community. They would invite me for barbecues, for gigs. We'd meet each other in every pub and bar and gig that you could think of in London. So, yeah, these people, obviously, I couldn't tell them about this, this, these things that happened in my life. So I just prayed to God. And lo and behold, after a couple of days, I found a good a church, a good church, like a solid Bible-believing church, like a three-minute walk from my house. And I found I found it by coincidence, obviously not. Very funny how I found it. I went to a playground just behind my house with my daughter and a friend of mine. And I always take the same route. But that day, my friend had to go shopping somewhere. And she said, don't you want to come with me? So I took I walked a different route because she asked me, do you want to walk with me? And I live in a very orthodox Jewish neighborhood in London. And that street where my church is, is an ultra orthodox neighborhood. So I said, okay, I'll walk, I'll, I'll walk with you. And I, I noticed something strange because my church does not look like a church. It's just a regular building. And I'm walking there and I realized this is a very orthodox neighborhood. Only ultra-orthodox Haradim live here. And there is this building and it has a big sign in front of it that says, Jesus is the Messiah. <laughs> and I looked at my friend and I said, this is so weird because the Jews don't believe, they don't like Jesus. So I took a picture of it, and the same day I went home, looked on the website, and they have a YouTube channel, and I started watching their lectures, and it was all about biblical prophecy, and they were linking today's events to what is to the Bible, to what is how it's linking with what's happening in the world. They are a very, very good biblical sound doctrine church, and I was just obsessed with watching it. And I found out that, that this church has a this month in prophecy lecture every last Sunday of the month in the evening. And I was working at the time every Sunday morning. So I said, great, I'm going to go. So I would only attend the prophecy lectures once a month in the evening. And I'd literally come into the church. I'd skip the singing part. I'd be like half an hour late because I didn't want to sing for the Lord. You know, I was like, oh, you weird Christians, whatever. I didn't fully accept it. I believed in God, but I wasn't a Jesus freak or, you know, like like these born again Christians. <laughs> so I went there, heard the lecture, and then just run out. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. I was just testing the waters. But eventually I started going more often. Then I stopped working on the Sunday. My boss no longer needed me on the Sunday. So I started going in the morning and they had a Sunday school. and. My daughter absolutely fell in love, was obsessed with the church and, and Jesus and Sunday school. God really put a zeal in her mm. for Jesus before me. Because she, she, if anybody would ask my daughter, what's your favorite thing? The church, the Sunday school. Honestly. So she loved going to Sunday school. And I said, great. It's great entertainment. So at some point I was going every Sunday in the morning. But then in the evening... I would go to Metalworks to my other church, you know, with my rock and roll boyfriend and, you know, smoking weed, drinking, fornicating. So I was kind of like double minded. I didn't understand what it means to follow Jesus and surrender your all that you'd kind of like stop. Well, not kind of, you just stop living for you. You don't do what you want. You do what God wants. Mm -hmm. Whether you like it or not, his ways are better than ours. Yes. But how did I know? <laughs> so I remember that, uh, in that time, God started doing the work in me already, and I didn't know it because I, I, I didn't want to go out anymore so often. I wanted At some point, I wanted to go only to the gigs of my boyfriend because he's kind of like a blues musician, blues rock, but he does his own music. So it's not demonic, satanic, whatever. So I said, you know, I'll just go to your gigs just for the sake of supporting you, being there. But I didn't want to go to Metalworks anymore because it is truly satanic. And I remember that one of the last times I was there, this is already after I started going to that church for about a year. I went there. I was standing in the crowd next to my boyfriend. And all of a sudden, it's like God revealed the truth to me because I could feel death around me everywhere. I started feeling demonic forces around me in that place. I started panicking and I had a full blown panic attack in the middle of the crowd. And something inside of me said to me, you don't belong here, get out. So I started crying 
And I told my boyfriend, I need to go home. He wanted to come with me because clearly he could see I, I was I was having a panic attack. He asked me what happened. I said, you cannot come with me. I need to go home. And um, even when I run out, my friends saw me that were smoking outside. They said, hey, Talita, what's going on? I was like, I need to go home. I need to go home. I need to go home. And I just got home and I just broke down because I could feel, I could feel the, the, evil around me everywhere and that was one of the last times I went to metalworks so I didn't want to go anymore um then one day in the morning on Sunday I walked to the church and I was having a conversation with my daughter about I don't remember about what about something irrelevant and all of a sudden I hear a voice it's like a thought being put in my head that tells me you need to get baptized here and I'm thinking to myself what just a voice, very intrusive, get baptized here, get baptized in this church. And I stopped talking to my daughter and even my daughter said, mommy, are you all right? What's happening? And I said to her, I don't know. I have this thought in my head that I need to get baptized in this church. And I kind of like tried to ignore it. And I said, whatever, continue talking to my daughter, sat down in the church. And the moment I sat down, literally one or two seconds after that, the screen went on and it said the importance of baptism. And the whole lecture was about baptism about how important it is to get baptized once you once you are an adult and you give your life to Jesus publicly. And after that, the pastor said, is there anyone here that feels called by the Lord to get baptized? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I had accepted as Jesus. I believed by that time, I believed the Bible. I knew Christianity was true, but I hadn't I hadn't made Jesus Lord of my life. I wasn't living in obedience to God. I was still doing my own thing, but I believed it. So just because of that voice, I said, yeah, me, I'm going to get baptized. And said, great, in a few weeks we have baptisms coming up. Come and get baptized. Okay, fair enough. So I got baptized. And after I got baptized, my life, was completely upside down. It started storming again in my life. Everything that could go wrong could went wrong apart from my relationship. So I started having these crazy labor pains that came out of nowhere. And I would have them once a week, twice a week. I had them every month. And these were very heavy pains that came out of nowhere and it would sometimes stay for 24 hours, sometimes for an hour, sometimes for five hours. And no matter how many painkillers I took, it wouldn't go away. And I even went to the hospital. I thought I had uh, a condition called endometriosis, had myself checked. Um, I did uh, scans, blood tests, and all the doctors said, you are perfectly fine. And I didn't understand all of a sudden. And I'd like also to mention that after I got baptized, every time I tried to sleep with my boyfriend, which was my boyfriend at the time already for like three years, I was in pain. And this is kind of the first time it triggered these cramps and they kept on coming back. So never had that problem before. This was after I was baptized. Um, so that all of a sudden became a weird thing because I was having this pain all the time. Um, I started having problems with my neighbor. I had a neighbor that was living there already for almost a year, never had a problem. After I got baptized, she started harassing me. She would wait for me to come home, literally wait for me to leave or come home. And she would open and close her door and she would start laughing very demonically at me, almost like a witch, like, <laughs> like crazy, crazy stuff. And she would throw buckets of water out of her window, trying even on my daughter. Every time I would wake up in the night, I would go to the toilet. She would turn the light on. She was properly stalking me to such a, a, an extent that I got really ill. And I never get ill. I get ill maybe once every six years. I never get flea, flu fever. Like I'm always, I have probably a good immune system. And I'm also very healthy because I was doing intermittent fasting and cold showers and, and all this stuff. So I got ill. I got really ill. And every time I'd cough and I was struggling to breathe, she would imitate me coughing at night. And that went on for like two weeks. And, and I just thought, what in the world is happening? I'm having these cramps. I'm having my neighbor harass me. Um, my fitness business didn't work out anymore. People started canceling. I was advertising it everywhere. I was trying to grow it. All of a sudden, customers disappeared. It wasn't picking up. I had problems with the father of my daughter. I, 
I mean, so much stuff happened to me. I started having nightmares again. I started dreaming and I'm, it's almost like in my sleep, I would shift between two realms and I could see demons. So strange, like all this stuff was happening to me and I, I didn't understand why, because I, I thought to myself, you know, I got baptized, I'm reading the Bible, I'm going to the church and everything was going wrong. Like the enemy really didn't want me to let me go. And one night I had a sleeping paralysis again. And that is something that hadn't happened to me for quite a while. And I remember again, waking up in the middle of the night and I could feel such demonic presence around me. And I tried to lift myself up and I couldn't. And, and I, again, I started praying to God and calling on the name of Jesus and boom, it let me go immediately, just like the first time. So I knew that there was power in the name of Jesus, and I knew that the Bible was was real, but I didn't understand why these things kept happening and why I didn't have peace. I didn't have peace. Everything that I tried to do on my own power didn't work. And every time I tried to open a door, God would close that door. And people would always think like, you can't finish it. Because every time I'd start something new, a project for my fitness or business, whatever, I would never finish it. And it's not because I couldn't finish it. God was preventing me from doing it. And people would say, you never finish things. Mm. You know, it's hard to explain that to people who, <laughs> who are not believers, but I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it at the time. And also the enemy still had a grip on my life because I was smoking weed, getting drunk, going to, to, to gigs. I was fornicating. I was still swearing while I was sitting in a church being baptized and whatever, you know. Mm. So after this sleeping paralysis, I got so upset again with God because I said, okay, I'm doing what you're telling me to do. You told me to get baptized. I'm doing that. What else do you want? You know? <laughs> so I got upset. And guess what I did? After everything that God showed me, I'm so sorry, Lord. Like, I'm really stubborn. <laughs> I went back to meditation, even though that I knew, I knew that it was bad, but I was willfully rebelling this time. Like, honestly, I was fully aware that meditation was an occult practice. And I said, I just need to have quiet because everything is storming again. I don't understand. And I, I was like ready to convince myself again that I'd gone crazy. Honestly, I was going to do the same loop. The enemy had me do the same loop. And the funny mm -hmm. thing is, is, the only thing that went well was my relationship. The only thing. Everything else was going wrong. So I started meditating. I stopped going to the church that I had been baptized. I stopped going for like two or three weeks. And even my, my daughter, she said, mommy, why are you meditating? You told me that's demonic. You're not supposed to do that. And I was trying to justify it. And she was like, you shouldn't be doing that. And after three weeks that I didn't go to the church and God had really put a zeal on my daughter to love Sunday school, she said to me, mommy, we need to go to church. And she was like, I don't care what you say. You have to take me to church. And I really didn't want to go. So we went to the church. And I, oh, I, I, I hate it all of a sudden. I really didn't want to go after I'd been going there for over a year. But I went anyway. And in the end of the service, I broke down in tears. And I could feel the presence of God coming over me, convicted me, and told me again, Talita, you need to keep going. You need to come back to me. And I just started bawling. I tried to make sure that nobody would see that from the right or the left. I kind of like tried to cover up my tears because everybody knew me that time. I didn't want to tell people anything. And at that moment, I realized I was playing with fire and I repented. But I was also, I was just tired, man. I was just so tired of everything happening in my life. Also with these cramps, I thought, what if I can't teach fitness anymore? If I have endometriosis or this condition, like honestly, my life is going to collapse. And I was just so tired. And the funny thing is, is that on the way back home that day after Sunday, I met a woman on the street and she just started randomly telling me how, how dangerous the new age is and meditation and that she has a friend that went mental after attending an ashram in India and that she used to be in the new age and she got out of it and Jesus saved her life. And I said, what are the odds? Honestly. So... That Sunday, when I came back home after the morning service, after speaking to that lady, I actually was supposed to go to a gig. I was supposed to go to a gig in the evening. And before that, I was supposed to go to a barbecue of one of my friends for Metalworks 
they invited me, you know, it's the regular thing we did. So I had kind of like a, a whole day lined up, like church in the morning, picnic with metalworks, and then a gig in the evening. Not very biblical for a Sunday, but yeah, that's what my life used to look like. But after all these things happened to me, I was so angry and so desperate for God because I had a feeling like I need to do something and I don't know what it is. And I always used to tell that to people, like, I have this feeling that I need to do something and I don't know what it is. And it was driving me mad. I said this so many times to my ex-boyfriend as well. And I, I just didn't get it. It was like I was running in circles and nothing was working out. So what I did is, Again, I decided to have a serious talk with God. So I, I canceled the barbecue. I canceled the gig. And in the evening, I started having a serious conversation with God. I started shouting at God because I was so tired. I was so angry and I was so desperate for God at the same time. So I remember saying to God, what? do you want for me? I was just like sitting here out loud in my living room. My neighbor must have thought I'd gone crazy. And I was like, I'm doing all this thing. I'm telling you all the time. What, I'm, everything you're telling me, I'm doing it. Going to the church, I got baptized. I'm praying. I don't know. Everything is going wrong. And why does, do these things happen to me? The sleeping paralysis. You've given me all these abilities, all these talents. I'm not allowed to use them. Like, what do you want for me? And then I started crying out and saying, God, you need to show me the truth. And I need a massive intervention in my life because otherwise I'm going to break. I don't know. And I really meant it. I like poured out my heart with so much anger towards God where I kind of like came to the realization I need God to take over, you know, and I wouldn't let him because I was still doing my own thing. But I didn't know it or I didn't get it because I was still kind of like half blind. <laughs> so that night, Everything changed because I woke up a different person. That night, I went to sleep and I woke up in the middle of the night. Must have been, I don't know, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. And a thought was being put in my head or it was an inner voice that said, your relationship is sinful in nature. You cannot continue doing that. And I was thinking to myself, why in the world am I awake in the middle of the night thinking about my relationship that it's sinful in nature and I cannot continue the relationship as it is? Because that was the only thing that was working out for me. So, <laughs> But God rat-filled me that night and he removed the blinders. And the next day, I knew immediately why, because it was a worldly relationship and I understood, I just understood it. Like literally God opened my eyes and I was so convicted about my sin. I could see through the lens of God and I could see my sin. I knew sleeping with my boyfriend was wrong. I just knew it. And I understood that, you know, God doesn't have to adjust himself according to my desires and my will and my lifestyle. I have to adjust myself according to his will and in his time. And I wasn't doing that. I wasn't living to serve God. I, I was my own God. And I had so many idols, my relationship, my fitness, you know. And that became very clear. And I felt so guilty and so convicted. It's unbelievable. Anyhow, that was the first night. Second night, I go to bed. And in the middle of the night, I wake up. And a voice, again, in my head tells me, you need to stop your fitness because there's a different plan for you. And again, I'm thinking like, I loved fitness. And I'm thinking, why am I awake in the middle of the night thinking that I need to quit my fitness? Very, very strange. Anyway, I forgot about it, woke up the next day. And then the third night, again, I wake up in the middle of the night with my eyes wide open. And this time with a scripture in my head. And it said what, Ephesians 1, 6. And I knew Ephesians was a book in the Bible, but I didn't know exactly what it was about. I might have read some verses here or there, but I never really studied, studied, and I couldn't quote verses from the top of my head. So that voice became so intense that I went to my living room, took the Bible, went to the book of Ephesians, and I said, okay, 
Ephesians, maybe I need, because the voice said Ephesians 1, 6. So I said, okay, maybe Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. So I'm reading that. And nothing spoke to me there that I said like, wow, this is something. Now it does, but not at the time. So I was thinking, you know, I'm already here. Why don't I just go and read and see what this whole book Ephesians is about? So <laughs> I started reading Ephesians. And when I came to the final chapter, I realized that Ephesians has six chapters. So now I, I, I had read Ephesians 1 to 6. And the Bible, as I was reading it, explained to me what was happening to me. It's like God pushed a button in my head and I all of a sudden could understand what it said. And it's about becoming a new creation in Christ, how the old dies and you live in the spirit and you put on the new self and you no longer live for yourself and according to the ways of this world. And it's also about this spiritual warfare. You know, like you wrestle not against flesh and blood. And that spoke so all of a sudden I could understand that I was in a massive spiritual warfare and it had been going on for a good seven years. Well, probably more than that since I moved to Israel. So I realized that I was in a spiritual warfare and I said to myself, OK, let's get this straight. I need to stop my relationship. I need to stop fitness and I'm in a spiritual warfare that became crystal clear. And I, I could see, I could see my sin. I could see what I had done with my life. God widely opened my eyes, my spiritual eyes. So I sent an email to the church. I was actually teaching Pilates inside a church. I was renting uh, different venues where I was teaching in the evening. And I sent an email saying like, you know, from next week on, the, uh, the room is available again. I'm not going to teach anymore because God has a different plan in my life. And this guy thought I probably gone a little cuckoo. <laughs> I didn't even know if he was Christian or not. He sent me an email back saying like, hey, are you OK? Is everything all right? Why all of a sudden you want to quit your fitness? I told him to keep the money because I've already prepaid for a whole term. And I said, just keep the money. I need to stop. And I said, yeah, I'm fine. God told me that he has a different plan for me. so. Oh, yeah, just it's available. Forget about it. And I also knew that I had to speak to my boyfriend. And how was I going to tell him this? Because this came kind of like out of the blue. So I went to the church on Sunday. And after the Sunday, I told him to meet me in the park. And we did. And then I just dropped the bomb. And I told him, listen, what you and me are doing right here is not okay. And then I told him, I have, a, I have a vision of a godly relationship. I want a relationship on God's term. But yeah, what you and me, this, this whole thing, because we didn't live together. I was always the one that said, I don't want to get married. I don't want to have kids. I don't want to have lived together. I never wanted to have any strings attached to anybody or, or, or nothing, you know. And he was super cool with that because he was the, the rock musician, you know, touring, going. And I was, we were kind of like part-time boyfriend, girlfriend. And the entire relationship was based on just feelings, emotions, attractions, nothing godly there. We'd drink, we'd have sex, we'd talk, listen to music, have fun. And that was it. There was no foundation whatsoever. And it was convenient to me for a while because I liked having my, my own control, my space and for him as well. But then all of a sudden I switched and I switched so radically, so quickly that it shocked him and he was overwhelmed. And I can totally understand it as well. Like, whoa, what happened to my girlfriend? I was a different person. So he asked me, what should we do? Should we live together? He was very, very shocked. And I decided I was going to fast on it. So I went on a fast, which is very strange because some, some you need to fast. And I never fasted before. I didn't even know the power of fasting. All of a sudden, I just felt like I need to fast. So I guess God wanted me. He called me to do so. So I just was obedient. I knew by now, like, you don't want to mess with God. So God tells me to do something. I go and do it. <laughs> so I fasted for two days. And I was waiting for an answer from God. And on the third day, when I met my boyfriend, he asked me, so did you get an answer? And I didn't. 
I didn't get any answer from God because sometimes God doesn't answer immediately and you don't know what he's doing in the background. It's a yes, a no, or wait. And God didn't answer me. So on the third day when I met him, I told him I didn't get an answer. He said to me, I need a yes or a no. I love you. I want to be with you. I need to know what you want. And then I told him I can't answer you because it's not about me and what I want. It's about God and what God wants. And he got really upset when I said that. Um, and obviously, I was madly in love with this man, but it wasn't about me anymore. I wouldn't dare going against God's will. And I knew that what we were doing wasn't all right. So he walked out. He was really upset. And my world, once again, came crashing down because, okay, my boyfriend is upset. Um, my fitness is gone. Um, I'm in a warfare. Like, like honestly. After everything I went through, everything come crashing down again. So I panicked. I called my pastor from work and I said to him, listen, my world is collapsing. I need to speak to you. And this was during the, during a weekday. And he said, OK, can you meet me today in the evening in the church? So I said, yeah, fine. So I went to meet him in the evening, went to the church and he brought another few ladies with him. And we all met in the office. and. I was at that point, I was so shocked by everything that happened in my life uh, because God gave me three revelations in a row telling me this needs to go, this needs to go. And you're in a spiritual warfare. And I understood, like, I need to give my all to Christ. I can't play games and have one foot in the world and one foot out because I was being double minded. And the Bible is pretty clear on it. You know, God wants full commitment, not only when it's convenient. And that's what I've been doing for such a long time. And I understood the cost. I understood it. So when I sat down on the chair in the office with the ladies and the pastor, I was about to throw all my stuff on top of them. And before I did, the pastor said, before you start speaking, <laughs> can I say a thing, one thing? And I said, sure, you can. And he said, before, before I came to the church, I started praying for you in my car and God put two things on my heart. He said, there's a problem with your boyfriend. There's a spiritual issue there. And Ephesians 1, 6. And I, my mouth, honestly, my mouth just dropped open and I started bawling because then I knew like this is not a joke because God had confer confirmed it through somebody else. And I started just crying and I was so scared. I was so scared. I didn't want to give up the love of my life. I didn't want to give up my popularity. I didn't want to give up my fitness. I didn't want to give up my sex life. I didn't want to give up my gigs. I, I just couldn't. And I just started crying and bawling and people started praying on me. And there was this lady that she started, she was so sweet. She started hugging me because she saw in how much pain I was. It was such a difficult moment for me because I realized that I had to change my life. Um, and that these things that I was doing wasn't good for me. And this lady started hugging me. She started crying with me, over me. And I must have spent there a good two, three hours. And the main prayer was that God will set me free. And they were asking God to intervene in my life and to help me turn my life around. Because I, on my own human physical power, impossible. And after a couple of hours, after we finished praying... I walked out of that church and I will never, ever forget <laughs> that moment that I walked out of that church. When I walked out of that church on the way home, it's like a heavy burden, a heavy cloud just fell off of me. I felt so much joy in my spirit and I felt very light, like a feather. I was on fire. It, it's like, like a heavy black dark cloud that was following me all my life just fell off and I started being so happy even though that in my flesh I was very sad because I realized that that's it I'm gonna lose everything but I was feeling so much joy in my soul I never experienced that kind of freedom that empty void that I had forever gone gone I just knew it Jesus is the truth the way and the life and yeah, it was it was like somebody gave me a happy pill, you know. It's like I was on drugs for the first time without actually being on drugs. 
<laughs> these were these were supernatural drugs. <laughs> yeah. <myself. laughs> so uh, I will never forget that. And everything changed in my life from that moment on. So many things changed. I was delivered of so many things. My neighbor, this crazy witch neighbor, mm -hmm. she moved out. She disappeared. Mm -hmm completely gone. These cramps that I had, these labor pains that I've been having for like a good six months, they were gone. I couldn't listen to secular music anymore. I could hear the blasphemous lyrics all of a sudden. I, I've never listened to it since I couldn't. And I was addicted to worship music, worship music that I never liked. I couldn't stop listening to worship music. I, I started dressing differently. Like I used to wear wow. always very tight, popped off to show off my body. I stopped smoking weed. Um, wow. My friends from Metalworks, a whole bunch of people, I knew so many people in the music world, they just literally disappeared apart from one lady. They all disappeared. Not one tried to contact me. And, and don't forget, these were my friends. For, well, they weren't, but years, years. And I would speak to these people every day. Like mm -hmm. every week I would see them at least once or twice in a gig or but they disappeared. And I was going to, I was thinking to myself, what am I going to tell these people because I, all of a sudden I was born again and then I understood what it meant to be born again. And I, I, I thought, how am I going to tell my friends that I'm not going out anymore and I'm not smoking weed, I'm not drinking anymore, I'm not fornicating anymore and all that stuff. I didn't need to. God just radically removed everything. Mm. I lost all my friends for Metalworks. The neighbor moved out. The cramps were gone. The wheat was gone. The alcohol was gone. And I was super happy. It was mm. crazy. And Unfortunately, my relationship also ended because I told my boyfriend, obviously, my ex-boyfriend, he experienced this whole change. He's seen it. And I also told him what happened in the church with my pastor. And I told him, listen, I made it crystal clear. I told him, you remember how I told you that God is in charge? I said, I don't live for my own selfish desires anymore. I want to serve God and I want to have a biblical marriage I want to serve God and have a Christ-centered relationship. I, and I told him, I can't live the way that we used to live. I don't want to walk around half naked, show off my body, get drunk, go to gigs and sing I'm on the highway to hell because it's not cool. And that's his job. He's a rock musician. He's in that world. And God pulled me out of it. So we had to make a choice. And I told him as well, you have to make a choice, you know. And I told him, if you're going to continue living the way that you do, you're serving the enemy. And he chose to serve the enemy in the world, even though that he loved me very much, the enemy has a full grip on his life. And I pray for him every day because I loved him so much. Even when we separated, I was still madly in love with him and I was leaving him because I knew it was, it was a stronghold. I had to leave. And that was probably one of the most difficult things that I'd ever done that the man of my dreams, love of my life. Now I understand it wasn't a relationship at all because we didn't share anything. Um, so, but I had to make a choice. I, I said, if I follow God, I need to follow his will and do things his will, his way, not, not my way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, unfortunately we went separate ways, which was very painful, not in the beginning. Cause I felt so happy, but, um, something that I didn't share in my original testimony is that after about a month, that I was super happy. I went through um, a heavy episode of spiritual warfare. I got attacked so badly because, you know, God set me free. I was delivered of, of so many things and I was super happy. And I was also addicted to reading the Bible. I just couldn't stop reading the Bible, worship music. I wanted to tell everybody about Jesus, you know, how he's ripped the shackles off me. But after a month, that I tasted the goodness of the Lord, I went through a season of isolation. And during that season, because God, obviously, after salvation comes sanctification, and I have been living so extreme in the world for so many years that God separated me. That's why everything was radically removed. And I was attacked by the enemy, and the enemy started playing tricks on my mind. Same what he did with Eve in the garden. Did God really say? And I started having doubts. And I was like, what if what if I made a mistake? What if I gave up everything? But what if it's not true, you know? And I started just getting horrific attacks. And I had a voice in my head that told me to basically kill myself 24-7 for months that was telling me, you know, you should end yourself. And and it was it was terrible. I couldn't sleep 
I, at some point I was on sleeping medication and even with the sleeping medication, I couldn't sleep. Um, I never had sleeping paralysis after that, but the enemy was just trying to wear me out and do everything to pull me back. And um, I was fasting a lot. I was praying a lot. I wasn't having any social life at the time. I was completely cut off and I knew I need to just persevere because I knew like the enemy is on my back. I could feel that. And that lasted for a couple of months where I was so weak. I couldn't eat. I couldn't exercise. I was hearing whispers in my ear. I was not sleeping well. Plus I'm a single mother. I have my daughter to look after. So it was very stressful. And I, in the Bible, it says, you know, God will not allow you to be tempted more than what you can bear. And he will provide a way out. And I felt like, no, this is too much, man. This is too much. So one night I went on my knees and I was at my end. And I literally said to the Lord, I said, I'd rather, I'd rather stop living after everything than, than having this for another week. And I meant it. And I just screamed out. And I said, I, I felt like Paul having a thorn in my flesh for months with no stop after losing everything, after giving every, everything up for God. I thought now that I'd given everything up for God. He owed me, you know, I had a bit of a prideful spirit. Again, lesson learned. <laughs> so. After crying out to the Lord, when I got at my wit's end and I said enough, and this was a, a, a final attempt of the enemy to pull me back, very funny thing happened because that night after I cried out and said, God, please make it stop. I can't bear it anymore. This is, this is honestly, this, I feel like I'm 80 years old. I went to bed and the next morning I woke up, took a bus to the dentist, had an appointment. And when I got out of the bus, there was a crowd of people around me. And it was one guy from far away pointing at me. And he said, Jesus loves you. If it gets difficult, don't give up. You're doing the right thing. Don't give up. You need to keep going. Just, just trust in the Lord because Jesus loves you. And he just shouted that out loud with all these people around me pointing at me. And I was looking to the left. And I was looking to the right to see if there's anyone around me. And he said, no, I'm talking to you. And then he came to about two, three meters close to me, took an alleyway to the right and boom, disappeared. Never seen this guy before, never seen him afterwards. And this kind of stuff started happening quite often to me during that season of suffering. It was like every time I was at breaking point, God did a little miracle in my life, you know, mm -hmm. to lift me up. And I now realize that it was necessary for me. God had to completely, completely break me in order to remake me because I'm so mm -hmm. stubborn. And I messed up and run away so many times. God kept on drawing me. He kept on drawing, drawing me. And I didn't want to listen. I didn't want to give it all up. So I kept on running, running, running mm. until God said, you know what, Talita, enough is enough. And then I knew I had to make a choice. And I did. And eventually, after these few months of, of like really intensive spiritual warfare, after I was saved, this is when finally, finally, I understood that I can do nothing without God, but I can do everything through Christ and that I just need to hand it to him and that I can just rest in the Lord. I never understood the peace of the Lord, the joy of the Lord. And I never understood when people say, just hand it to the Lord. I was like, well, you, you talk very easily. What does that mean? Just hand it to the Lord. But now I do know what it means. You just lean on him, not on your own understanding, and he will direct your steps. Yes. And then you can breathe no matter how, difficult your circumstance no matter how much suffering now mm -hmm. i can truly find joy in my suffering i take it as a compliment because i'm doing something right you know <laughs> talita you are just such an amazing woman seriously i i am so moved by your testimony and i know that people that are watching are as well and what i hear what i see is the relentless pursuit the relentless love of Jesus and how he will go after that one and you were that yeah. one and he never yeah. gave up on you and he never gives up on us. Anna. Oh, so can you tell us Talita um, what you're doing today and where people can see more of you? Well, I have a YouTube channel uh, called the corner of truth um, where I speak about these kind of issues about spiritual warfare. And I also speak about questions that I had before I came to Christ. Um, uh, yeah, and I, I evangelize a lot, really. I'm not like a professional evangelist, but uh, I do try to plant. I go around and plant seeds. I'll go speak to anyone on the street, in my work, 
Um, and I'm just waiting on the Lord wherever he tells me to go, because the Bible says, don't be anxious for nothing and just trust in the Lord and he will provide. So I'm not really planning anything ahead anymore. I just live every day for the Lord, try to praise the Lord in everything that I do. And uh, yeah, just be a living witness, really, whether that's on the streets, whether that's in my work, <laughs> whether that's on, on, on this channel, whatever I can do. Yeah, because that's all that matters, really. I love it. Thank you again, Talita. I just want to close with, there's a quote I love by Oswald Chambers that says, let God be as original with others as he is with you. What does God's personal workings in your life, Talita, mean to you? Freedom, total freedom and salvation and love. Yes. Amen. Will you pray with with us today? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Father, we pray today. I want to thank you for presenting me with this opportunity to speak on Julie's channel and to be a living testimony for you, Lord. I thank you for everything you've done in my life, and I hope that it will touch the hearts of many. I hope that it will spread wide and far, Lord, and that people will be able to witness your power, your glory, and your might, Lord, for you are good. Your ways are better than our own. So I want to thank you. And I also want to ask you to bless this ministry of Julie, that you bless her and her family, Lord. Thank you for the work that she's doing for you. And I also pray that you will bring many more people with nice testimonies to her so that they can share of your goodness and your glory so that people may understand who you are, that you are the truth, the way, the life, Lord. And that's all that matters. So thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.